Before we get into this video, I want to thank all my Patreons who have been supporting my channel. They are Galalad, Nikki, Franti, Eurowinner, and Pancake John. I can't thank you enough for supporting this channel. If you would like things such as early access to videos, and exclusive content updates, and other benefits including Discord roles, please look at my Patreon linked below and consider subscribing. I would also like to dedicate this video to the LGBT community, all around the world, past and present. Your fights to be your authentic selves, and the contributions you have made towards our community throughout history have not gone unnoticed. Be loud, be proud, and happy Pride Month. Anyway, let's get into the video. A theocracy, as defined by Google, is a system of government in which priests rule in the name of God or a god. Of course, this is a very surface level take, since a theocratic state would normally contain members of the clergy in major parts of the government. But the idea of a state's main purpose, of existing as being in a dedication of a deity and ruled by the religious institutions, is at the crux of it. The modern day Islamic Republic of Iran is a prime example of a theocracy. Established after the revolution against the Shah in 1979, the Islamic fundamentalists who worked with other groups against the Shah, including liberals, conservatives and socialists, managed to overthrow the Shah, ending his rule. However, the Islamic fundamentalists soon turned on their revolutionary partners, establishing themselves in control of the state, and on the 11th of February 1979, the Islamic Republic of Iran was established. Now, Iran has a complex political structure, which is in part theocratic and in part democratic, where there are elected members of the legislature, but the religious institutions of Iran have a direct influence and indirect influence on the functionality of the Iranian state. How does this relate to the United States of America? I mean, the title itself is kind of a hyperbolic take, but the notion of one of the largest liberal democracies in the world starting to introduce bills targeting trans people among its various states is quite concerning. And another concerning element is the Supreme Court's leaked decision in the Mississippi Department of Health et al. petitioners versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization where the leak shows that on a majority verdict, the Supreme Court has overturned the original decision in Roe v Wade, meaning that abortion is no longer protected under the Constitution of the United States. When this verdict will be officially given, I must add. So, how does this relate to a theocracy? Well, back to Iran, the leading example I mentioned, has very strict laws regarding the purposes of bodily autonomy. Abortion in Iran is only legal in the cases of where the mother's life is in danger, and where there are serious fetal abnormalities which would mean the child is not viable after birth. An example of this is the condition of anencephaly, where the patient is missing a large section of their brain, skull and scalp, and the condition is so bad that the child would normally only survive mere hours, but if they are lucky, maybe a handful of days after birth. Iran does not allow on request or choice abortion for any other reason stated before. The United States is a federal system in contrast to the Iranian unitary state, which means abortion can vary by state to state, and has done for many years. When it comes to LGBT rights in Iran, homosexuality is punishable by death, or forcibly transition homosexual men into women. Iran is the third highest country in the world where gender transition takes place, but I implore you, do not mistake this for some kind of trans acceptance acceptance among the Iranian government or the Iranian people. There is something far more sinister which we will get onto, and it's a concern I have that some trans people, especially in the free world, are falling for, due to our outdated procedures and long waiting times for treatment, that on the surface this sounds good. But the last nation any country should emulate is Iran, especially a free country. In Iranian society, trans people are still heavily discriminated against, and not just by society, but also the state. Shadi Amin, the director of a group called Six Rang, which is an organization helping LGBT people in Iran, states that your rights will be violated before, during, and after surgery, saying that it ranges from invasive questionnaires to invasive and painful virginity tests and this will only be allowed with parental approval, even if the person is an adult. Not only that, 
the doctors who undertake transgender surgeries are not properly trained, and as a result, have led to botched procedures. They have damages because most of the doctors are not specialists on transsexual issues. Most of the doctors are beauty surgeons, Amin explained. That is the reason for two deaths that we could report. The person is there in a hostel and is dead because of the bleeding after the operation. Now, if you heard me say hostel, this was not a mistake. One thing which is actually explained is that in Iran, hospital beds aren't given to transgender patients on default after their sex change procedures. This means that usually trans patients will have to find their own means of accommodation to recover. In the case of Araya, a 38-year-old who identifies as non-binary, but for legal purposes is a transgender man in Iran, even after the transitioning process, he had to let go of his entire family. We are going to say that something happened to you. Araya says, you cannot have any relationship from anyone in your past life. Araya has to oppress his true non-binary identity from Iranian society. Amin also claims that the sex change process is also a way of cleansing homosexuality in Iran. You will have to change your sex or have a change in your sexual orientation. They medicalize a transsexuality issue. They say that transsexuality can be cured by sex, according to Amin. Back to the abortion issue. Prior to Roe v. Wade, the state of Michigan, for example, had a statute from 1931 which outlined the state's law on abortion. Under this statute, abortion would be considered a form of manslaughter, except in the case of where a mother's life was in danger. The law remained dormant as Roe v. Wade guaranteed the right of an abortion under the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. The sad thing is, Having read Roe v. Wade, I felt like this decision was inevitability, as a justification for the original ruling did feel rather weak. The original ruling of the Supreme Court was the 14th Amendment, which states, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. In the Roe v. Wade judgment, Justice White concluded that This right of privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action, as we feel it is, or, as a district court determined, in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. The thing is, granting such a broad right was always going to get legally challenged. When the presidency of Donald Trump occurred, it essentially meant the fate of Roe v. Wade was sealed. Those in opposition to Roe v. Wade do have a strong point when they assert that this is such a broad interpretation of the Constitution and this is essentially a form of judicial activism. What happened as a result of this, an entire new school of jurisprudence was born on the American right wing. Jurisprudence is a very broad term within itself. It is an entire field of study. In short, it is the philosophical aspect of law, how law is interpreted, and how it is applied. This launched the new school of legal formalism in the United States. Now, legal formalism itself did exist prior to Roe v. Wade, but essentially this launched a brand new revival in the philosophy. Legal formalism in the United States, specifically modern legal formalism, was best seen in the former Supreme Court Justice, Justice Scalia. Scalia was known for his formalist approach to the law, and in particular, his adherence to the legal school of textualism. The idea of purpose of legal textualism is to look at the legislation before you and interpret the words in its own plain meaning, not using any other source or source of law in terms of making your decision. Simply, it relies on the text alone, and nothing else. This is also combined with the interpretation of the US Constitution under legal originalism, which is where the idea to interpret the US Constitution is based upon how the original signatories would have done so when it was passed. I do want to point out that these are very simplistic explanations of these schools of thought, because I believe to explore these ideas properly, they will need videos of their own. We're talking about very, very big schools of thought here. Before I digress, the more formalist branch saw Roe v. Wade as a form of judicial activism, with the courts going way too far and broadening beyond the scope of the Constitution. We will explore a bit further in a moment, but I do just want to point out that this ruling doesn't necessarily mean the Supreme Court justices want to ban abortion themselves, and the ruling to overturn Roe v. Wade's decision doesn't necessarily mean abortion is going to be banned. 
What it does mean, however, is that abortion will be dealt with at the state level when this verdict is official, and that means that individual states come into play. It is important to remember that in some US states there is a large evangelical Christian base, and this is where they will come into force. As a base, they are very politically energised, and we have seen in the past decade alone there have been states trying to pass heartbeat laws, and in Louisiana they have recently proposed a bill which could outlaw miscarriage and make it a criminal offence. These types of bills are proposed to pander to that evangelical base, and in states where they have much influence, they will likely be incredibly keen to legislate on abortion matters and abortion rights. We even had a GOP Senate candidate from Arizona saying he wants to criminalise contraceptives since this ruling has been leaked. Now, specifically back to Roe v Wade and its original ruling, an important contribution in the analysis of the original ruling was by a man called John Hart Ely. Ely, for the unfamiliar, was a legal academic in the United States and widely regarded as one of the most important legal scholars of the 20th century. He developed his own legal theory of what is known as political process theory, which as the name implies is to advance the legislative process, keeping it healthy, and avoid making the courts too partisan. His approach was to avoid the restrictions of the former approach, on how restrictive it can be just looking at things in the old style context, however he was also concerned about the too much broadening of rights as seen in the more moralist approach and interpreting the constitution that way. His words do mean merit, and he was very critical of the Roe v Wade ruling, summarising, Roe v Wade seems like a very durable decision. It is, nevertheless, a very bad decision. Not because it will perceptibly weaken the court, it won't, and not because it conflicts with either of my idea of progress or what the evidence suggests is societies, it doesn't. It is bad because it is bad constitutional law, or rather because it is not constitutional law and gives almost no sense of an obligation to try to be. Not only that, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was not a fan of the original ruling either. Ginsburg is one of the more liberal justices who passed away during the Trump administration, and she was replaced by Amy Cohen Barrett, a more conservative-leaning justice. In her view of the original ruling, Ginsburg stated that, My criticism of Roe is that it seemed to have stopped the momentum on the side of change. Ginsburg's belief was that instead it would be a legislative change, rather than a Supreme Court ruling, to ensure the right to an abortion. In addition, she also had some concerns over the ruling itself being granted due to privacy, and not the woman's right to choose. Roe isn't really about a woman's choice, is it? It's about the doctor's freedom to practice. It wasn't woman-centred, it was decision-centred, Ginsburg added. Ginsburg does raise an interesting point, and if I'm completely honest, the way the Americans treat their Supreme Court system is rather unhealthy. The Supreme Court should be a very important body, don't get me wrong, but the open politicisation of a court, in my opinion, is never a good thing. Furthermore, I believe the Democrats made a grave mistake in my personal opinion. They made this assumption that Roe v Wade was solid enough to last, and it clearly wasn't, or that they would hold on to the presidency enough to shape the Supreme Court, which they didn't. The Democrats, during the 110th and 111th Congress, so from January 3rd 2007 to January 3rd 2011, had a majority in Congress, however they failed to get any pro-choice bills through during that time. Now, as of the 117th Congress, which started on January 3rd 2021 and will end on January 3rd 2023, the Senate is now controlled by the Republicans, while the House is controlled by the Democrats, meaning despite having the presidency and the House of Representatives, and not having the Senate will be a major legislative bloc to them, and this has already proven to be the case. House Representative Session 3755, which was a session brought before Congress, was to introduce a new act known as the Women's Health Protection Act of 2021. In the act, it outlined the issues people face to accessing abortion, and even noted how the access to abortion being restricted could mean restrictions to access to care for LGBTQ health services as well. If you didn't know, in the United States, lots of LGBTQ health services are provided through Planned Parenthood. In the act, it mentions fetal viability, and fetal viability essentially means the fetus can live independently outside of the womb, which is around 23 to 24 weeks, usually. This bill wanted to outlaw restrictions on abortion prior to starting that, noting that Section 8A, a prohibition on abortion at any point or point in time prior to fetal viability, including a prohibition or restriction on a particular abortion procedure. 
this bill was in effect to try and prevent a response to the Texas Heartbeat Act. The vote for the Women's Health Protection Act of 2021 passed the vote in the House of Representatives on the 24th of September 2021, with the vote split of 218 in favour and 211 against, but it narrowly failed to clear the Senate floor on the 28th of February 2022 by a narrow vote of 46 in favour to 48 in opposition, the bill was defeated. It seems to me that Democrats noticed their mistake. They relied on Roe v Wade being enough, and at the time it was okay, but losing the 2016 election meant that the Supreme Court was shaped in the image of Donald Trump and the Republicans. So this feels like they were trying to make amends for that afterwards, but of course, the Senate being controlled by the Republicans made it rather difficult for the Democrats to actually clear it through the Republican floor, meaning the bill was defeated, and we have now seen the leaked decision in the Mississippi Department of Health case which shows that Roe v Wade will be overturned. There are midterm elections coming up in the United States, and the reversal of Roe v Wade being leaked by the courts, it has made some states already act. A notable example is California, where the state's governor, Gavin Newsom, has said we can't trust the Supreme Court and wants to enshrine the right to abortion in the state's constitution. As it stands, 16 states and the District of Columbia have laws protecting the right to abortion. According to the Goodmatcher Institute, these include California, Connecticut, Hawaii, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Washington State, just to name some of them. Not only that, California plans to go further. According to the New York Times, a new bill is set to be proposed and presented to the voters in the November elections, and the state of California wants to position itself as a refugee state on abortions for Americans in the more repressive states. Furthermore, the state of California is considering offering tax breaks to some companies who want to move from states where abortion could become illegal. I've said this a lot about America before, I do find America a strange country with such variation amongst its states. Some states are essentially progressive utopias. Take cannabis for example. Many American states are far ahead of other places in terms of making cannabis a recreational drink. Only really Uruguay and Canada are similar to the United States when it comes to cannabis policy. Compared to Europe, where even in the Netherlands, where there are some murmurs around some people in politics to potentially put restrictions on cannabis in the near future. It's also important to note that in the Netherlands, cannabis is only decriminalised. It is not legal for recreational purposes. Meanwhile, you have some states which do resemble theocracies, where bodily autonomy be damned. I have travelled the United States before, and I have been into northern Florida. In that part of the world, I've seen the billboards. Now, I don't want to come across as I'm shitting on America like some smug European, although at the moment I do sound like I'm some European shitting on America for some reason, but these religious billboards, I remember seeing them when I was around 15 years old and being creeped out. Now, I know for a fact the rest of the United States is not like northern Florida. It is an extreme example. This is the evangelical heartland. But you have to remember, people who live here do have a major influence on such decisions in the United States and in the state of Florida. One thing we have seen a lot of commentary on, from a lot of people, is the don't say gay bill. And one take I have seen from mainly people who are defending the bill is that the bill doesn't say gay in it, and these people are actually correct. There is not one reference to don't say gay or trans. Yes, neither of these words appear in the legislation. But I don't think I have to tell you that these people are being incredibly dishonest and are actively gaslighting people to diminish and downplay the effectiveness of the bill. This is why I decided to look at the bill itself. Reading the preamble of the legislation, it states that the bill is an act relating to parental rights and education, amending section 1001.42 of the Florida state, requiring district school boards to adopt procedures that comport with certain provisions of law for notifying students' parents of specified information. So the intention is set. There are things which means a school will have to notify a student's parents of specified information. The preamble also says that it is prohibiting classroom discussion around sexual orientation or gender identity in certain grade levels or in a specified manner. The bill states that classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade 3 or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. 
there is an inherent problem in that wording that some people may not have picked up on. So we do have some obvious limitations. The state shouldn't discuss these things with kindergartners or third grade students, which I am led to believe are children up to 9 years old, which on the surface many would find understandable. I can understand why you may not want to teach children about these things when they are this young. However, there are some things which the bill says in its preamble and statute. I am referring to specified manner, age appropriate, developmentally appropriate, and state standards. The thing is, there is nothing in the bill that says what a specified manner is, or what the state standards are. This is true for age appropriate, outside of kindergarten to third grade of course, and developmentally appropriate. This is left up for the education districts of Florida to try and figure out. This bill seems to undermine the core essence of law, that is, legal certainty. This bill is not certain in what it is asking, and it feels rather vague by design. This is interesting as we have already seen one development, and this is the case of Casey Scott. Scott, an arts teacher at a high school who apparently was dismissed under this bill. According to Scott, she said that students began drawing flags to express their identity, and she confirmed to them that she herself is pansexual. This led to the school board deciding to dismiss Scott under the new legislation. I just want to point out that in this bill, it allows the parents to sue the school boards for damages. If there is a breach in this law by the school boards, they can be held liable and the parents can take damages. They have this vague bill. This is outlined where the bill states, requiring school districts to bear the cost of the special magistrate, requiring the State Board of Education to adopt rules, providing requirements for such rules, authorizing a parent to bring an action against a school district to obtain a declaratory judgment that a school district procedure or practice violates certain provisions of law, providing for the additional award of injunctive relief damages, and reasonable attorney fees and court costs to certain parents. Naturally, it tends to mean the schools will adopt a strict approach when interpreting this law, as they could be financially liable for any errors in the law. You have to put yourself in the situation of the school board when it comes to the case of Casey Scott. They've got this new bill, they have to interpret this new bill, they have to apply it in every single school around their district, and if they make any errors, they could be held liable and lose money. It essentially acts as a form of censorship, since the school boards have to regulate their own behaviour and conduct in order to be compliant without really knowing what is right or wrong, and do you want to be the first school board to be sued? Yeah, you can see how this is kind of a major kerfuffle for them. It must be a major headache in deciding what is right and wrong and what could get you liable or not. It just makes more sense to silence any and all discussion around LGBT issues to be on the safe side. And of course, this totally wasn't the decision of the grand old party of Florida and their governor Ron DeSantis. They're pro-free speech guys, they're pro-freedom guys, just we'll put this bill to protect kids and we won't define things to help protect kids. How about all those gay people just be a bit quiet, you know? Yeah, why not? Just be quiet around the children, gays, yeah. Ugh. Anyway, this bill draws comparisons to a piece of legislation passed in the United Kingdom 34 years ago. Uh, it's finally time to talk about section 28, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't want to talk about this. But here we go. It's time. But it's the plight of individual boys and girls which worries me most. Too often, our children don't get the education they need, the education they deserve. And in the inner cities, where youngsters must have a decent education if they are to have a better future, that opportunity is all too often snatched from them by hard left education authorities and extremist teachers. <laughs> Children who need to be able to count and multiply are learning anti-racist mathematics, whatever that may be. Children who need to be able to express themselves in clear English are being taught political slogans. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values 
are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. And children who need encouragement, and children do so much need encouragement, as so many children, they are being taught that our society offers them no future. All of those children are being cheated of a sound start in life. Yes, cheated. So, the time has finally come. It's time to talk about Margaret Thatcher and her horrendous legacy. There's no real better way than to start with Section 28, one of her most infamous bills during her reign of terror. Don't worry, we will revisit this woman some other day on this channel again, but Section 28 is what we need to focus on today. It is a clear mirror to what is happening in Florida. Section 28, or officially known as the Local Government Act of 1988, was an amendment to the Local Government Act of 1986, which added in the prohibition on promoting homosexuality by teaching or publishing material, hence the term Section 28, as it's nestled in in the middle of this bill. The statute itself stated that, A local authority shall not a. intentionally promote homosexuality or publish material with the intention of promoting homosexuality. b. Promote the teaching in any maintained school of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. Now, this bill was vague, and you have to ask yourself, what does it mean to promote homosexuality? This was a difficulty many local authorities, teachers, charities, and many other institutions struggled to get to grips with. What did it actually mean? The bill helped create a climate of fear amongst LGBT people in schools, and led to widespread protests. It was condemned by many in the opposition parties at the time, including the Labour Party, Liberal Democrats, and the Greens. The best summary of the problem of Section 28 comes from the Liberal Democrat MP, the late, great Charles Kennedy in 2000. Kennedy was such a great supporter of LGBT rights, and was opposed to Section 28 at the time of its inception, and even said this about Section 28 regarding Thatcher on Question Time. She'd got into her mind that somehow all of local authorities and the education system in this country was some great left-wing conspiracy to undermine the moral fabric of the nation, and it was daft then, and it's daft now. I've been an M I have been an MP for 17 years. I could not count seven or 17 times that I've had a letter from a constituent or a visit or a phone call from a constituent telling me, do you realize that the teacher at the end of the road in the local school is somehow corrupting the youth of our country? They're not. Trust our teachers. That's why we educate them. That's why we train them. And they are more than sensible enough to handle this without the politicians making the mess of it that it is allowed to become. A right-wing conspiracy where the education systems are corrupting the youth and potentially turning them gay? Does this sound familiar, America? To this day, this bill lives in infamy amongst the British LGBT community, and it has took years to overturn. It was watered down in the subsequent major government and then finally removed from law in 2003 by Tony Blair. Scotland, as part of their new devolved powers, revoked it in 2000, three years before the rest of the United Kingdom. The reason I brought up Section 28 is pretty clear. It's obvious the Floridian Don't Say Gay Bill has drawn its inspiration from Section 28. The wording is vague, but the enforcement is clear. Parents can sue the school board for breaches of the law, so effectively by being vague, the school boards are self-regulating themselves, and stifle any type of LGBT talk. This is why the slogan, Don't Say Gay, was adopted, since it would effectively mean the school boards would not allow it to be said. The thing is, we are seeing the halting, or even in some cases, the erosion of LGBT rights now across the United States, and transgender people are facing the brunt of it. Montana is the most recent state to have passed an anti-trans bill, which has banned transgender people from changing their legal sex on documentation, even after going through a medical transition. Sex is immutable, according to the order, while gender is a social construct that can change over time. Sex is different from gender and is a mutable genetic fact which cannot be changeable even by surgery. This is what the executive order said, which was penned by Adam Meyer, a director of the Public Health and Human Services in Montana. This was a response to a state judge who temporarily blocked enforcement of a law that required transgender people to have undergone a surgical procedure before being allowed to change their gender on their certificates, as he believed the statute to be unconstitutionally vague. This is why the Montana state's government has tried to work around it, 
The order means that transgender Montanans won't be able to change any documentation, such as passports or social security numbers, which will have serious implications when it comes to changing employment or even travelling abroad. The Supreme Court of Texas are allowing the state to investigate transgender people. This is after Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, signed an executive order stating, Dear Commissioner Masters, Consistent with our correspondence in August 2021, the Office of the Attorney General has now confirmed in the enclosed opinion that a number of so-called sex change procedures constitute child abuse under existing Texas law. Because of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services is responsible for protecting children from abuse, I hereby direct your agency to conduct a prompt and thorough investigation of any reported instances of these abusive procedures in the state of Texas. Texas law also imposes a duty on DFPS to investigate the parents of a child who is subjected to the abuse of gender transitioning procedures and on other state agencies to investigate licensed facilities where such procedures may occur. To protect Texas children from abuse, DFPS and all other state agencies must follow the law as explained in OAG opinion number KP0401. Sincerely, Greg Abbott. Playing on the false narrative and assertion that trans children are being groomed into being transgender, a off-the-walls conspiracy that bears no merit in reality. As Christopher Hitchens once said, that can be asserted without evidence, can be dismissed without evidence. This idea that there is some conspiracy that trans youth are being conditioned to be trans is an assertion, a lie. There is no proof, yet the state of Texas will investigate families on this assertion alone, not other signs of abuse such as neglect. Greg Abbott thinks that trans children are being abused by their parents, but doesn't think you should make gun debates political after 19 children and two adults were slaughtered in a Texan elementary school under his watch. Funny how that works for Republican governors, isn't it? The difficulty is, whilst actually recording this section, things update so fast that I can't keep up. In Governor Abbott's state of Texas, yet again, a 16-year-old transgender boy attempted suicide, stating the new laws and the political environment that Texas has created as a reason why he wants to commit suicide. Weeks after he tried to attempt suicide and recovered, an investigator from Child Protective Services came to the family's home to investigate the attempt and also believed that his mother is an alleged predator of child abuse for allowing her son to take hormone replacement therapy as prescribed by medical doctors. As we all know, Governor Abbott and the Child Protection Services are now self-appointed doctors. Isn't this grand? If you can't detect the sarcasm in my tone, then, well, <laughs> um, I envy you. Um, this has been, ugh, just the speed of everything at the moment has been ridiculous and I can't keep up. By the time this video is out, it feels like there's going to be even more developments I have to catch up with. I don't even want to predict for a second where all this could go because I'm being honest with you, it's so fast, so out there and just so cruel in some circumstances. I, I can't, I can't, I can't predict it. Like, it's wild. Anyway, before I digress too much on the state of Texas, back to the United States as a whole. According to the New York Times, 18 states are now banning or restricting transgender people from participating in sports, and these are in Republican-led states. Not only that, the most alarming ones is when it comes to vital healthcare treatment. For those who don't know, a very basic thing when it comes to transgender healthcare is people will need access to hormone replacement therapy in order to get gender-affirming care. It basically allows you to get the characteristics of the gender identity you want to be with. This is a very simplistic explanation, it's far more detailed than that, but in short, that's what it is. Anyway, Arkansas was the first state to ban transgender healthcare for under 18s, and 15 states are now considering similar proposals. North Carolina plans to introduce Bill 514, which will ban trans care for anyone under the age of 21. This is concerning as restricting trans affirming healthcare is very dangerous, especially for trans people who are currently on medication. I want to let Americans know you might be upset that I am a foreigner commenting on the United States. There are a couple of things I could say to counter this, but there is one very important thing. There is a saying outside of the United States that when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. The United States is arguably the most influential country on Earth, and I don't just say this to pander to some kind of sense of American exceptionalism. It is just many societies do see America as the gold standard of a nation state, due to the economic, cultural and geopolitical importance of the USA and what it plays on the world stage. 
anti-LGBT rhetoric and legislation is not a phenomenon occurring just in the United States, which we will get onto in a second, but the fact of the matter is, it is very concerning to see arguably the most free country in the world impacting some incredibly draconian laws regarding LGBT people. And as an LGBT person myself, I kind of feel duty bound to make a comment and even make awareness of this. Anyway, let's move on to modern day Europe, and more specifically, Hungary. The Hungarian government in 2020, during the height of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, voted 133 in favour to 57 in opposition to a bill which changes sex on a civil registry with one sex assigned at birth. In effect, the Hungarian government under the leadership of Viktor Orban has signed into law a ban on allowing people to change their sex on their documentation, effectively making it impossible for transgender people to change their legal sex. In addition, the Hungarian government has been very busy in regards to anti-LGB legislation and has passed a controversial bill referred to as Section 28 on steroids by many critical voices in the press and widely condemned by the President of the Commission of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen, for what it did towards the LGBT community. The amendments to the Child Protection Act, the Family Protection Act, the Act on Business Advertising Activity, the Media Act, the Public Education Act, were ratified into law on the 15th of June 2021. These amendments made it illegal to share with minors, anyone under the age of 18, which is deemed to promote homosexuality or gender reassignment, as well as placing a ban on depicting LGBT content on daytime television, meaning they can only be shown in the post-watershed hours, and barring companies from running campaigns in solidarity with the LGBT community. So, any kind of rainbow capitalism you want to see is effectively outlawed. A group called We Are Open, which is made up of companies including, but not limited to, Tesco's, a major grocery retailer, Lego, Deutsche Bank, and Facebook, criticised the bill, claiming it would have a negative impact on their employees and harm the abilities to make their workplaces more inclusive, stating, The bill is also contrary to business interests of the Hungarian enterprises, 63% of which are actively committed to a diverse and inclusive workplace. Furthermore, the Hungarian Psychological Association and the National Association of Hungarian Journalists, MUOSZ, also protested the bill. The Hungarian Psychological Association claimed that these measures would do much harm to children's rights to access information regarding sexual health, sexual health education, free expression, and claiming that restricting such information could go against the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and the World Health Organization have fought for. Meanwhile, MUOSZ claimed it would violate the press's right to free expression to force them to not report on issues they deemed worthy to report on at times during the day, and also claimed that the bill deliberately blurred the line between pedophilia and homosexuality, bisexuality, and transgenderism, pointing out that pedophilia is a crime, whereas homosexuality, bisexuality, and transgenderism are not, and certainly cannot be considered a crime. Thankfully, the Hungarian courts have annulled the controversial Section 33 for now, but I would like to add that this doesn't mean it will not be an issue for future Hungarians to face. Boljedar Nage and his boyfriend are an example of many LGBT people who are leaving Hungary in droves. Nage told Vice News, When we moved to this house, we were just two, my boyfriend and me. But then we decided that we'd like to have a family and some kids, so we built some new rooms. I started to buy toys and kids books and board games. Our plan was this would be my room and this would be the kids' little room so we'd be next to each other. But now there is a new law that actually bans same-sex couples and single parents to adopt kids in Hungary, so we plan to move from here, not just because of the adoption, but you know, this whole situation in Hungary. Asked if he had hopes for the future of the country, Nage responded, even if the opposition will win, I think it will take years and decades to really change society. We don't have time because we are getting old and we want to live a happy life. Hungary, like Poland, are seeing an exodus of LGBT people as they leave due to the rampant bigotry being exercised by their government. Poland has had towns declare themselves as LGBT free zones, free of the LGBT ideology. The magazine Gazeta Polska have been handing out anti-LGBT stickers which feature the LGBT flag with a cross through it. Hundreds of Polish towns have declared themselves anti-LGBT zones. Now, these are largely legally unenforceable but they are contributing towards a hostile environment towards LGBT people. The EU Parliament has condemned the LGBTI free zones. A statement produced by them reads, 
MEPs notably condemned the areas free from LGBTI ideology established since the beginning of 2019 by dozens of municipalities, counties and regions in the southeast of Poland. These local governments have issued non-binding resolutions pledging to refrain from taking any action to encourage tolerance of LGBTI people and saying they would not provide financial assistance to NGOs working to promote equal rights. The European Parliament urges Polish authorities to condemn these acts and to revoke all resolutions attacking LGBTI rights. In addition, MEPs have called on the EU Commission to monitor how EU funding is used in Poland. In addition, President Andrzej Duda has signed a draft amendment to the Constitution of Poland to forbid same-sex couples from adopting children, and this has been submitted to the same. In the proposal, it states, Only a minor can be adopted and only for his benefit as it has been envisaged so far, but now this provision will have a constitutional status. Secondly, only a marriage which is defined in the Polish Constitution in Article 18, which is a union of a woman and a man, can adopt together. And thirdly, what was added that a minor cannot adopt a minor, a person living together with a person of the same sex. He pointed out that this project did not concern biological parenting. Yes, you heard it right. The Polish state has a constitutional ban on same-sex marriage. Marriage, as a union of a man and a woman, as well as the family, motherhood and parenthood, shall be placed under the protection and care of the Republic of Poland. Hungary and Poland aren't the only nations where Europe has seen an increased level of hostility towards LGBT people. Boris Johnson has come under pressure from many LGBT orgs, politicians and figures within the United Kingdom for many of his actions since coming into office in June 2019. The major one is that he appointed the girl boss Liz Truss to be the Women's and Equalities Minister, who decided to abandon the proposals to change the Gender Recognition Act to allow self-ID, which were proposed by the May government. This was seen as a major blow for the transgender community of Britain. When Truss was quizzed by the Equalities Committee, she said that there were fundamental differences between her and the LGBTQ advisory panel, so she dissolved it, effectively meaning she decided to scrap it against all advice. Boris Johnson, after receiving questions from the Leader of the Opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, about a windfall tax on May the 18th, replied with saying, The Leader of the Opposition can't even define what a woman was. A transphobic dog whistle by a floundering Prime Minister embodied in controversy, so he resorts to appealing to transphobia as a way to legitimise himself somehow. Mr Johnson has shown he's willing to throw anyone under the bus for his own political ambitions, be it members of staff, cabinet ministers, and even entire groups of people. Boris has even said he wants to see trans women barred from competing in sports, have sex segregated spaces and ban the Gillick competence in the case of trans healthcare. The biggest embarrassment and the most disgraceful action Mr Johnson has done against the LGBT community is his decision to scrap conversion therapy bans. Allegedly, he did not form the Women's and Equalities Minister Liz Truss about this. There was a furious backlash by many Conservative MPs, so Boris did backtrack. Kind of. He now wants to ban gay conversion therapy, but doesn't want to ban trans conversion therapy, which angered many, including Ian Anderson, the LGBT advisor to the government who resigned, stating that Boris is trying to wedge gay people and trans people against each other. Boris Johnson's health secretary, Saji Javid, the objectivist, a man who is pro-trans rights under May, shows his careerist attitudes by backing the Prime Minister and has decided an inquest into trans healthcare for minors where he seems to have already concluded the outcome, that too many trans children are receiving incorrect care. Not only that, on defending Boris's reversal on the trans conversion therapy ban, Javid even said that trans children could be victims of abuse. He said, Is it a genuine case of gender identity dysphoria? Or could it be that the individual is suffering from child sex abuse, for example? Or it could be linked to bullying? Bravo, Sajid. Just wow. No one, whether gay, straight, lesbian, transgender, or bisexual, should have to live in fear. Javid said in 2018. He is now contributing to the climate he claimed he wanted to destroy. The biggest insult on all this by the Conservative Party, by Boris Johnson, by Saji Javid, by Liz Truss, by them all, is there is one Conservative MP, the only MP in Westminster and the first MP in British history who declared themselves to be openly trans. Jamie Wallace. The Conservatives are saying all this while one of their own parliamentary colleagues is trans. Well, this feels like a bleak video. I have outlined so many concerns across the USA regarding abortion laws to LGBT rights. 
Hell, and even in Europe, it's not being an easy ride for LGBT people, let alone the rest of the world, where there are some even more harrowing stories. We've talked a bit about Iran, there's even Saudi Arabia, there's the Qatari World Cup, which we could talk about another day for sure. Um, it's just very concerning. I know this is all bleak, but I do want to give some hope. Let's start with the United States. There are the midterms coming up, and if any Americans are concerned, I would suggest you take your voting rights seriously. It is important to vote regardless of how you view your politics. Now, you have a real, material, tangible reason to go and vote, if you would like to protect your rights. Progress is never linear, and there are challenges along the way. The reason I take such a staunch position on abortion is directly related to my stance on transitions, and that is on the lines of bodily autonomy for the individual. I'm not going to tell people how to vote in their own national elections, that would be incredibly unethical and wrong to have a foreigner lecture them on why and who they should vote for. I will, however, tell you exactly where I stand on particular issues. Abortion, in my opinion, should be allowed in virtually all circumstances. It is my sincere belief that the right to abortion is important for the mental, physical and social well-being for the person undergoing such a procedure. Their safety is paramount and anything to jeopardise the health of the individual is an affront to their human rights. Article 5 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights reads, No one shall be subjugated to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment of punishment. And Article 25 1 states, Everyone has the right to a standard of living, adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widow old age, or the other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Similarly, the anemic case of Roe v. Wade, as Ginsburg pointed out, was the ruling was focused on the physician rather than on the woman. And for me personally, that was an entirely wrong way of looking at abortion rights and how Roe v. Wade did it. If a state forces someone to go through a pregnancy without the ability to terminate the pregnancy, I sincerely feel that this is a failure by the state to protect and preserve the individual's right to access their own health care. Look, I don't think anyone has an abortion easily. The last thing anyone needs when making such a decision in their life is anyone else's judgement. If you are all about protecting life, maybe show some empathy for the life in front of you before you start casting your own judgments. Now we've got the heavy topic of abortion out of the way, let's move on to the LGBT community. Especially as it's Pride Month. We should be happy, we should feel happy, and we should feel proud. And there is news in the past few years that are worth taking note of, as there are good things happening across the globe. Angola last year became another country to decriminalise homosexuality, joining nations like Botswana who did it in 2019. Not only that, Angola made it illegal to discriminate against gay people for the purposes of employment. The Constitutional Court of Japan acknowledged the fact that the Japanese government doesn't recognise same-sex marriages goes against the Constitution of Japan. Although Taiwan is the only country in Asia that performs same-sex marriages, this is seen as a major step forward for an incredibly socially conservative society such as Japan. Campaigners in Japan hopes this means same-sex marriage could be legal in the near future. The nation of Switzerland, one of the most socially conservative states in Western Europe, decided to legalise same-sex marriage by referendum in 2021. Two-thirds of voters voted for it, showing a lot of acceptance amongst the Swiss public. The Republic of Ireland achieved a similar fate in 2015, being the first country to approve same-sex marriage by referendum, as well as legalising abortion by referendum in 2018, with a large majority of two-thirds, leaving Italy as the only major Western European country as the odd one out, with most states are now allowing same-sex marriage. Elsewhere, France and Canada have banned conversion therapy, all types of conversion therapy, against LGBT people, and the Greeks introduced a conversion therapy ban, albeit with a slightly watered down measure which allows the consent loophole, however, this is a big step forward for a very socially conservative society, especially by European standards, to make, especially since the Greeks don't even have same-sex marriage yet, which many within the country have called for. Poland, which has LGBT free zones, saw free regions scrap them, after the European Union threatened to cut off funding to these parts of the EU. In countries like Nigeria, where it is very strict in terms of anti-LGBT laws, influencers like Babriski are helping to break down barriers and the modern perception and discourse around LGBT rights and people within the nation. 
In the very hyper macho world of football, Blackpool's Jake Daniels is the first footballer in England to come out as gay since the former Norwich City and Nottingham Forest icon, Justin Fashion, who did over 30 years ago. He was met with overwhelming support within the football community and wider society, compared to Fashion, who was actively rejected by his brother and at the time was seen as doing it just for the attention in the early 1990s. For every Idrissa Ghana gay, we have Bariski, Jake Daniels, and many more amazing people who help shift the perception and acceptance of LGBT people worldwide. There are many trailblazing LGBT activists, and while the road ahead isn't easy, there are people making big strides. There are allies in human rights organizations such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the Rainbow Railroad, a Canadian organization who has helped over 3,100 LGBT people since their founding flee from Western Asia, the Caribbean, and Africa to relocate from their home countries to societies in Europe and North America, which are more tolerant towards LGBT people. Another organization, more locally to myself, is the Good Law Project, who have been fighting against certain legal cases, including Bell v. Tavistock. In the original case, it ruled against the Gillick competent, minors being able to give informed consent, to trans-affirming healthcare. The Good Law Project launched a judicial review on this judgement and won, allowing trans youth who had their healthcare suspended resume it. The Good Law Project are currently looking to launch a legal challenge against the NHS for failing trans people in regards to healthcare, as well due to poor waiting times and the NHS's reluctance to work with private providers in some cases, despite NHS directives informing GPs to do so. Institutions such as My Sister's House in Memphis, Tennessee is building homes for transgender women, specifically for black trans women and genderqueer people who face higher rates of homelessness than other demographics. And to top it all off, Orban's referendum to introduce some of his anti-LGBT measures was successfully defeated due to the low turnout, as it failed to reach over 50%, which is required in Hungarian referendums. LGBT campaigners alongside Amnesty International, who were fined by the Hungarian state for this, managed to mobilise enough support to reduce the turnout. You have to remember, we are in a very online area, and we are essentially political junkies. We are in these areas of discussion and debate essentially by choice. If you thought UK Twitter has anything to go by, this country would be the most hostile country in the world for trans people to live. We didn't get the nickname Turf Island for no reason. However, this is a distorted view, as the general public, according to polls, are supportive of trans rights and a ban on conversion therapy, including for transgender individuals. The people who oppose trans rights broadly tend to be two things, male and old, and even then, it changes drastically amongst age on men. They also have outdated views in some respects, but we are only now coming to more prominence as a social group. But even then, old male conservatives think trans women should have the right to a domestic abuse centre for women if they require their services, which is even ahead of the Equalities Act of 2010. There are some people standing up for us, and while this wave of gender critical nonsense is coming for us, and there are efforts to restrict abortion, it won't last. I started high school only a few years after Section 28 was taken off the law books. I remember the debates around same-sex marriage, and now most people who were against it now regret being against it. We have allies in positions of power, and why we have every right to be concerned, things can and will get better. Have some hope, have some faith, and be vigilant. The United States has midterms, and these could be crucial about deciding the future over abortion laws in the country. Things worth having are never obtained easily. But by God, I have faith. We will get what we need in due time. Ignore the noise, keep the faith, but never lose sight. In due course, we will get what we desperately desire. To quote one of my heroes, I am not an optimist, but a great believer in hope. Hi, this is Post Video Bree talking to you all, and I just want to say if you've made it this far, I'm grateful for that. I wanted to make this outro because so much has changed, um, for the worst, because I did record this video back in late May, early June, so it has been a long time coming. I came up with this video concept back in February, but I wanted to tackle other projects before this one, and it was close to my heart. I really had to think long and hard how I wanted to do this one. Um, seeing so many broad anti-LGBT and specifically anti-trans bills was my inspiration. Then seeing the leaked ruling from Roe v Wade really made me want to greenlight this video. And obviously since then we've had the official decision come out which has led to this massive backlash which was expected and entirely understandable. 
I wanted to try and explain a little bit as to why Roe v Wade was controversial and why people have been gunning to overturn it for a long time, um, and I did feel this day would come. It's just a difference when the day actually comes versus knowing it's going to come. Um, so it's been quite sobering um, for a lot of people to adapt to the new normal. Um, and I'm deeply concerned for what this could mean for Americans going forward. And of course, what it could mean for the rest of the world. Thankfully, my Prime Minister, despite his many, many faults, has said that he doesn't agree with this decision, and that he believes that the right to choose is an important right. I could talk about the specifics of UK abortion law, but in short, we have effectively on request up to 24 weeks. There have been some positive moves on the trans front, but also a lot of negatives, but things such as Hawaii, they have now signed one of the most positive moves out of any state. The Transgender Health Bill on the 18th of June, which means now insurance companies are unable to discriminate against any trans people by labelling facial feminization surgery, hair removal, voice therapy, and top surgery, which is the removal of breasts for trans men and people assigned female at birth, as well as other health services, now means Hawaiians are in a position that they don't have to worry about their insurance company refusing to pay on these things, which is a very, very good thing. Um, things are concerning, not just in the United States, but across the world. Reproductive rights are still quite hardly fought for in many corners of the world. I'm kind of lucky that I live in a country where we seem to have a strong acceptance of it. Despite our legal wording being quite anemic and not as free as I'd like, at least in practice, it is arguably one of the freest systems for people who want to access reproductive care. Look, I'm not going to sugarcoat things. They are getting tough. And my final point was not to say things are all going to be fine and dandy. I don't think they are. I don't think you're naive enough to even believe that yourselves. But we have to keep fighting. I know a lot of people are kind of alienated at the thought of voting, saying what's the point, but you are looking now at a situation where there is a party who are willing to try and do something, and a party who are willing to do the exact opposite. I'm not even suggesting you have to stand the moderate Democrats or anything like that. What I am saying is quite simple. One party is very likely to try and enforce the right to abortion. The other party is very unlikely to do so, and in fact is doing everything in its power to do the complete opposite. There is a fundamental choice here. But voting isn't the only thing you should do, let me be absolutely clear. I believe protest, and although if you are willing to take the arrest, civil disobedience is something which many people in rights campaigns have done, not violence. I can never condone violence for many reasons, not only my moral objections, also the fact that I don't want to be legally culpable for something like that either. Look, it's going to be tough, so please take care of yourself. But remember, be vigilant, mobilise, vote, demonstrate, argue. One thing you have especially in America, is the First Amendment. You have a fundamental right to talk without the state limiting it. Bitch, moan, and complain. Don't let them get away with this. Make it absolutely clear how you feel. Tell people, inform people, educate people, demonstrate. There's so much you can do. Democracy is more than just merely voting. It's more than a decision-making process. If you engage with it properly, you have a chance. Apart from that, the only things I will leave with is I am very thankful to all the people who have contributed their voices to this project. I left the credits in the middle of the video of who they were. You can find their various socials. For the ones who don't have socials, I do apologise, but of course, I can't really shout you out if I don't know. Um, but please, in some of them, check out their channels, check out their Twitters. They're all great people, and I can't thank them enough for helping me on this project. As for that, I do have a Patreon. I have been making content, and this one has taken me a lot of time. The original recording I had to cut a lot was over an hour long, and now with this outro, it is going to extend to an hour long. Um, so if you want to support my channel and support me as a creator, please look at my Patreon. I'm thinking of making some changes over there. If there's a reason why you wouldn't sign up, and but if I did some things, you would, please let me know. I am entirely open to suggestions questions and ideas, I'm still quite new to this. Apart from all that, the most important takeaway is this. 
take care of yourselves, be safe, and for the love of God, just stand up for what you believe in. It's so important. Take care.